We are very happy to have this opportunity to have you be a part of the Multiple Perspectives and Learning and Teaching um, course in the EDD doctoral program. Dr. Shelton, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself personally and briefly describe your educational background and your research interests? Sure. So if I had to sort of define where I fall in the, the sort of scientific domain, so broadly speaking, what, what would you call me? What kind of scientist? Um, I'm a cognitive psychologist and a cognitive neuroscientist and what that really means is that because I'm very interested in how people learn, so that's sort of my focus, um, I would be considered a psychologist because that's a psychological function and then I use tools that look at both brain and behavior so many people would say well I use the tools of neuroscientists. In truth I consider myself a learning scientist, that's what I'm most interested in is um, how do we learn? What are the functions that go on in learning? How can we enhance those functions? My undergraduate degree is actually in psychology, but that's sort of a misleading thing because I actually had a medley of majors throughout my undergraduate career. Um, everything from political science to film theory to chemistry was really where I spent most of my time, but I ended up with a psychology degree from uh, Illinois State. Um, I think that worked well though because then when I did graduate work, my graduate work was at Vanderbilt um, in cognitive psychology. Uh, most of my work in graduate school was on how people learn, remember, and reason about environments, so you know the everyday world. And I spent a lot of time working on this issue of spatial representation or how we represent the world, but also learning about neuroanatomy and neurophysiology because I think one thing um, that is often missing when we talk about um, why people learn a certain way or how these processes actually work is understanding that the implementation of that is also going to constrain what you can think about. And so while I am not necessarily interested in neuroscience, you know, neurophysiology for the sake of, of understanding how, how cells operate, I am interested in how an understanding of that might constrain and help us think about uh, bigger issues all the way up to why someone is struggling with a particular learning topic. Um, after my graduate work I did postdoctoral work at Stanford um, learning to do functional brain imaging. So I use uh, fMRI, um, MRI machines just like are used for diagnosis but we use it to actually look at brain activation. Uh, following my postdoctoral fellowship I started here at Hopkins on the faculty. I actually began here for the first decade in um, psychological and brain sciences, a traditional psychology department um, in arts and sciences. And during that time, my interest in uh, sort of spatial learning and memory really started to evolve into an understanding of individual differences, which then naturally led to thinking about how that impacts much more directly educational issues. And so that has led then to um, taking a position here in the School of Education with a joint appointment at the Center for Talented Youth. My research interests continue to be in learning and particularly using spatial learning as a, a venue. I would say if you, if you pin me down to what's my sort of passionate question right now, it's whether or not spatial skills might be fundamental learning tools that underlie a wide range of learning and how individual differences in that domain might lead us to better, um, more effective teaching. Um, in a wide variety of domains. Could you give us a potential example about spatial skills, what they are? Sure. So spatial skills are actually, a lot of people say I'm good at spatial skills or I'm bad at spatial skills. And the truth is, you might be good at some spatial skills and not others. So what are spatial skills? Well, some of the ones that people think of most commonly in the world are things like, oh, am I, can I navigate? Do I get lost easily? That's what we call sort of um, large-scale spatial skills, your ability to navigate in the world. And actually, humans are quite good at it. If you think about it, we don't get lost on a daily basis. We get lost in new locations, but, but on a daily basis, we actually have very good representations of our world and, and, and different ones, depending on who we are. So that would be large-scale space. There's also... Um, things like our ability to mentally manipulate objects. This is one that's very heavily studied in the research literature. How, if I give you block figures, can you see them rotating? And people vary dramatically on their ability to do that. We also look at things like your ability to take other people's perspectives in the world. It's a little bit different. So can I think about what the world looks like from another person's perspective? Um, there are skills like visualizations. That is, if I give you a diagram, how good are you at 
understanding that diagram with, with or without verbal instruction, how good are you at creating visual explanations for, for processes? And it's th skills like that that I actually think probably have a significant role in learning and, and maybe the skills where we want to um, start thinking about what do you need to do to develop these skills in very young children. So very nice segue into thinking about the learning sciences. So in the Sawyer reading, the introduction states that the goal of the learning sciences is for interested professionals to better understand the cognitive and social processes that result in the most effective learning. So for the educational professionals who are enrolled in the EDD program, what are the critical factors they should consider as they are embarking on earning a doctoral degree and conducting research about a problem of practice? So I think when it comes to the science of learning, one thing I'll say is that um, I think we're, we're casting a new era of science of learning that's even broader than perhaps what, what has with the early envisioning in the, in the early 90s when this really became sort of a new, I would say a new field, but really a new interdisciplinary approach to thinking. And in this new era, I think we're enhancing that idea that it's really interdisciplinary. And, the, and beyond just needing to engage people across psychology and education and, and now neuroscience, um, as well as policy, um, I think we're also starting to think about the fact that this is, these are problems that should be approached from many levels. And I think one of the important things, stepping back from the very get-go, is when you think about what is the problem, you have to think about at what level do you plan to enter the fray on that problem. And so the first thing you have to do is not just define an area of interest, but very specifically what are the goals you want to accomplish. Um, so for example, uh, there's a lot of talk right now about how to teach physics. Physics is a very popular topic in the learning sciences, especially at the undergraduate level. Before you can even start answering this question or, or deciding how to approach the question, you have to ask yourself, well, what do I mean? Do I want to adjudicate among existing uh, teaching approaches? That's going to necessitate entering the fray in a particular location. Do I want to look at designing new methods? Well, that may mean wait for the classroom, start with very small steps and look for what's going on there. Um, are we talking about designing implementations or improvements in very specific parts of the teaching? So is it about Am I interested in sort of what kinds of visualizations might be added to a physics curriculum? So depending on which of those goals I want to accomplish, that's going to dictate then where you want to enter the problem. At what level do you want to start, you know, at the practice level or do you want to go down to the basic science level? And then who do you need as collaborators to, to, to actually support that kind of work? So I think that's one of the things that um, from the science side we often Miss. We often think we have a problem and we know where we want to attack it, but I think really defining those goals um, puts you in the science of learning. It really puts you, it helps locate you within that range. Um, and then I think the, the, some of the factors that, that people need to keep in mind if they want to study a problem of practice and bring it into this sort of bigger um, world of the science um, is to keep in mind that learning depends on many factors. I think it's very easy to think about the learner or to think about the learning environment, or to think about the materials. And it's the interaction of those things where the bulk of our um, real understanding has come from, is, is in those interactions. And that means knowing who your stakeholders are, knowing where you're going to want to look for um, potential avenues uh, for techniques, if it's a matter of developing technologies, if it's a matter of looking for different um, teaching methods, where do you want to look and who are the people who are going to know those things. And then the other is to stress the need to think very broadly about evidence. So as I said, I think we've entered a new era where what we call science of learning has really been broadened. So in a more historical approach, there was often this sense that if you weren't talking about practice, if it wasn't connecting to practice, it was probably not learning sciences yet. And I think we've backed off of that now and we're saying, well, actually, we love the notion of evidence-based practice, but we're probably going to really be better off with evidence-informed practice. And evidence can come in a wide variety. So go back to the physics question. It may be the case that the evidence I need to start understanding perhaps some specific problem with visuals, I need to actually go to the visual perception literature and look at the phenomena at the very basic level, which probably means finding a collaborator who works on those problems and creating an interdisciplinary team that can help inform what it is I want to, to understand and study about the problem. 
So I think this, again, the notion of really defining the goals of the problem, that you, that what are the goals of, of this work um, in a very specific sense. I, mean, I think we all have the big goal of improving learning, making more effective teaching, you know, making teaching more effective, but you then have to break down and say, well, which part of that can I actually tackle? And then who are the collaborators I need? And what kinds of evidence can I garner for that? And I think that's where the current science of learning atmosphere that's building is going to serve people very well because I think there's this acknowledgement of becoming much more interactive. Um, so it's not just interdisciplinary and thinking broadly, it's actually becoming interactive with the community of, of scientists very broadly defined. Mm -hmm.